right, and welcome to another edition of Air Power Live. Travis Steerwalt with my account manager friend, Eddie, Eddie Rose. Rose. So, we're in Chattanooga today, just in case you didn't know that, and we're filming down here at one of our other branches. So, just to let you know that we got more than High Point, right? Yeah, and first of all, or second of all, because you just had a first of all, <laughs> I want to thank a couple people. I'm going to thank the first one. Uh, Chris Saylor with Shurcon, thank you very much for setting us up with these hooks for these uh, videos today. We are using them in about three or four videos in the same day. So, uh, long time friends, Shurcon's great for hooks, masking, masking, plugs, caps, all that. Custom uh, masking. Hot temp, t high temp tape, all of it. They're fantastic. Thank you. Great business partner. And we want to thank Devilbus who is part of the Carlisle group that allows us to um, have our nice little lab coat on here for protection. This is going to come in to play in just a minute, but it's about improving your electrostatic process. So um, we'll get started. Here we go. Well, you just said it. We're here to talk about improving your electrostatic processes, whether that's liquid or powder. So let's talk about that. Similar techniques for electrostatic spray between liquid and powder. Very similar techniques. What's the number one? What's the number one rule when you're approaching the part with either gun? Shoot the hard areas first. That's right. Hit the Faraday areas very first. What's a Faraday area? Well, some guy called Faraday figured out that if you had an area <laughs> that was hard to reach, hard to access. There is a phenomenon where you're spraying the powder coating in or the electrostatic liquid and it just doesn't want to stay put. It doesn't want to stay there and it builds up um, some kind of a repelling yep. force inside of there. Yep. So you have to adjust things. In the electrostatic process for a powder gun, I've often told people this, what is a powder gun other than a powder delivery method? Anyone? Anyone? It's an air hose. It blows air through that, through that gun. So if you're trying to jam a gun up in here and you've got a high volume of air coming through here, you're just displacing the powder. You're just blowing it straight out. That goes for anything. If you're a flat piece, a bar stock, a round stock or, or, or end stock, a corner stock, whatever, you're, you're going to have the same problem. Takeaway from that is lower velocity equals higher transfer efficiency, which improves your electrostatic process. Correct. All right, let's talk about powder coating specifically. Um, there is a great video that yours truly, Eddie Rhodes did, uh, that we're gonna try to put a link at the end of this video. That video was about gun to part distance. When you're, when you're shooting a cloud out of your powder gun, there is an optimal target range that you want your, your part to be in. So I don't want to get really off deep on that because you did but, a fantastic but job. But let's touch on it a little bit. So I use this as a rule of thumb, right? So that's about eight inches for the average person and maybe get you another couple inches there. When you go into the recessed areas, the Faraday areas, you may have to, to go in a little bit closer, but don't spend any time there. Try to pull that back out. As part of your gun settings, you can go to the recoat or recessed mode and have a better shot of getting it into the Faraday cage. We've got other videos on that about the controls and how to best utilize those, but that's, that's, a, that's a key element there. Also with the electrostatic liquid, you can turn the voltage down and get similar results. However, the electrostatic liquid has a better shot of staying in the Faraday areas because the wet paint's going to stick versus blow out when the powder. Okay, so we've talked about that. Now let's talk about another problem that's kind of the opposite of Faraday, which would be back ionization. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let's explain what back ionization is. If you have your powder gun and you're shooting a flat surface or really whatever, any surface, and you get that gun really close to that substrate and you're still triggering on and you're blowing powder and you come back out, uh, lay that back down. What can happen is that area that your gun was right up next to, your gun electrode was right up next to, gets that area super excited, just super charged there. 
And when that goes into the oven to cure, it never fully relaxes. That area is still rough. So when it comes out of the cure stage, you have a rough surface of, of powder that's now like either pinholes or you know a large cluster of pinholes or a rough area like sandpaper that now has to be sanded down and recoated. Most, more than likely, it's, it's a part reject in your line. One thing to think about with that for the back ionization, what Travis was talking about, about tip to ground distance. If you think about your electrostatic field that's out in front of that gun, it's, it's big, right? So you're taking all of that voltage, all that energy, and pinpointing it, and it's just too much, right? So try not to get too close. So target distance, very relative for a good finish and optimizing your efficiency. One thing about the target distance that I want to stay on is if I am here, and my electrostatic cloud is way back here for the wrap around, I've lost a lot of that attraction coming to the back. So if I'm here, I'm way too close because this is where the end of the field is at. I want to push my part back towards the end of the field so I get more wrap around and I have less passes. As an operator, I don't have to work as hard. As a business owner, I'm saving money. And you have a very good object lesson in that video that you did, Eddie, With on the balloon? gun to part distance. We basically taped a balloon to the front of the gun to show you what a cloud surface area would be or what the coverage area, and it worked fantastic. So I encourage you to go to that video. We're going to try to put a link to it at the end of this. Um, the wrap effect. We need to touch on wrap effect and also large parts that are large panels. Uh, you have to be careful when you approach panels. Uh, and there's, there's multiple ways of multiple different gun tips uh, and uh, tip sizes with the volume of powder that'll come out. But how you approach that, there, there's a phenomenon called tiger striping. Yep. Where if you're, if you're spraying your cloud or your pattern up and down and you're coming across, if you, if you take too wide of a stroke, those areas where you weren't like here those areas become very light and you, you know you'll have literally tiger striping through your part uh, also <clears throat> when it comes to wrap if you have the right tip on this gun and you're spraying this the proper way by the time you get done spraying this and you go to look at the back side or you turn it around to spray the other side most of the back side of this is already going to be powder coated. Stay tuned. Very gonna, little fill in. Stay tuned. We're going to do a video on that. Yep. So that's coming up next. Um, so take it over to Eastat. The, the best way to think of how to improve my transfer efficiency with electrostatic is to, like Travis said, pick the right air cap, pick the right fluid tip so that you know that you're getting the right amount coming out of the gun, set your cc's per minute flow rate or your ounces per minute flow rate. And if it's liquid, you can take a wet film thickness gauge. And after you've sprayed it, you can touch it and see how much is on there and do a test spray so that you're not applying too much. If you're applying too much, you're literally taking dollars, hanging it on these parts and sending it out to your customers and they're not paying extra for it. You are. So you're penalized by putting too much on there. So you want to put the right amount. So technique is really important. Travis hit on, touched on, paint the hard areas first. Paint the corners, inside corners, and Faraday area first, right? Paint that, come to the back. So if you're on a part like this that has a back edge, like this, don't paint this edge and this edge. Split your pattern. Hold that, Travis. Thank you, sir. Split your pattern so that my pattern is coming down just a, la a tad wider than the part itself and shoot down it and it will cover both sides and these lips at the same time. Non-electrostatic, you have to paint each side, you have to paint inside the holes, you have to paint the edges. You don't have to worry about edges with electrostatic. Train your operators not to do that because they don't have to paint an edge ever. It gets attracted to it. So paint it. If my fan pattern was this way with my gun held this way, that's that's done, right? But then, but then the other side is already finished. You, you paint do, with the you paint with the groove with the Faraday, and you're done. You're not going to have to 
go back and paint and paint and paint and paint and try to get it covered. Yep. With big panels like this, one of the things that I try to encourage people to do with either pipe or a big panel like this, even though this has lots of holes in it and you think, gosh, I'm just not going to get it coated, the electrostatic will coat that for you, right? You have to trust it. One of the things that Travis touched on, the tiger striping, you have to 50% overlap with liquid. Not so much with powder, but with liquid, you 50% overlap. Where people have trouble and not getting proper film thickness from top to bottom and side to side is your technique of how you go about painting it, right? So if you have this wide of a fan pattern, start with it up here because now I come back on my next pass and I'm down here and I'm 50% overlapped. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Trigger off of the part, come to the part, go across the part. You can leave it triggered or you can trigger on, trigger off, trigger on, trigger off, doesn't matter. But 50% overlap and always make sure to coat beyond your parts. If you're starting to get picture framing, which is something else, another phenomenon, and it's getting heavy on the edges, you can come short of that edge and it won't build up quite as much on the edge from the wrapped effect, right? So. Next side, you're there. All right, let's talk about a few things here. Um, we want to talk about electrostatic or e-stat painting and powder coating, uh, things that are important to consider, not just the application of spraying, but things you need to consider. When, when you are using electrostatics, it is very critically important that your, the area that you're spraying in, your environment is very clean. Uh, we're charging particles, right? So if we have other particles that are floating through that could possibly pick up charge, you have a higher potential for, for uh, you have a higher potential for uh, part contamination as they're moving through the line or going into the cure cycle. A couple of reasons for that. One, this is a great big vacuum. This booth is a vacuum. It's pulling everything in your shop straight towards it, right? So if we got anything airborne and I've got an electrostatic field out there, we can charge those dust particles. Those dust particles are going to be attracted to your part and create Correct. a bad finish. Um, keep, your, keep yourself clean. Don't be putting anything from your person onto the part. So wear your PPE. All right, uh, proper air caps and fluid nozzle. We touched on that a little bit. We did. There are a variety for both styles, powder and liquid. There's all kind of nozzles. Don't be afraid to experiment with them. And don't be afraid to ask your supplier to show you different nozzles for your e-stat guns or your powder guns. There are different nozzles. There are, are different sizes for different volumes. Um, and you know, a wider pattern can help with larger parts or a, a, a smaller, thinner, uh, or, a round, or a round pattern for round parts, right? Get a round, you can do round pattern out of a liquid electrostatic gun, you can do it out of a powder gun. Match, no. your, match your profile of your part with what you're doing from out of your gun. Match extensions. Your extensions. Extensions are available for up to your six feet. Powder gun, and I'm not sure, are there extensions for, so there's extensions for e-stats too? No. No. No, only powder. All right, so for the powder guns, you've got extensions that'll come out, what, 30 to 50? Oh, you can go to six feet. Yeah, and so if you've got big, if you're shooting pipe of some kind, you really have to get up in to get a full coating and, and an even coating through. Hard to reach areas are, are fantastic for those. So, hooks, we talked about hooks. Yes. It's critical to maintain ground. We did a video just a little bit ago. It's on everybody's mind in the shop, they just forget about it. You have to have good clean hooks. You can't have hooks like this and expect a good ground. With proper ground, you get better transfer efficiency and it'll improve your electrostatic process. That's why you're buying an expensive tool. You're buying an expensive spray gun to improve your transfer efficiency, get it out of it with a good hook. That's right. And follow that all the way back to the ground rod. <clears throat> so hook design, uh, there's custom options. There are, there are companies that only build custom racks yep. for platers and powder coaters. And there's a reason for that because uh, load 
uh, let's skip it my monitor, load density in an automatic line has everything to do with how, how profitable you are. Line density makes you more money because you get more parts out per hour, right? However, with electrostatic, you gotta watch out. You will get parts too close to each other. They will rob from the other one and you'll have a problem there, right? But ground clamps are abundant. There's multiple of them. Get your ground to the rack and to the part and don't lose the ground. Make sure that it goes to a true earth ground rod that's driven in the ground. Wet it out about once a week, pour a bottle of water down it. That way you maintain your ground, the earth doesn't dry up and pull away from it. And if you're watching this from a very arid area like, you know, Phoenix or, you know, the Southwest, uh, it may take you a lot more than that, you know, but you may need to Average. take a lot more liquid in down into your your ground rod. I've also heard uh, some of the old timers talk about a trick that they would use. They would build the booth in the in the the shop. They would drill their hole through the concrete and get get down to dirt, and uh, they would bore out a, a good starting hole for about a foot or so. And they would take rock salt like you used to in an ice cream maker and they would pour rock salt down in that hole before they drove the, the copper rod in because it would help to break up that copper and get more branches of it to try to get a, a stronger ground. Just get a good ground. Just to, all Just for the sake ground. of getting a better ground because uh, it's that important. So to keep a good ground, you clean these on a regular basis, you PM them, right? We want to do probably four passes max, and then you clean them. There's multiple ways to clean them. You can put them in a burn-off oven. You can put them in a chemical strip. You can put them in a fluidized bed, sand. You can blast them. Or if they're the really small hooks, very similar to this, just toss them, recycle them. So, dirty hooks. There's a good example right there. It will come off, it will get on your parts, you will have rejects, so take care of that. Dirty racks, dirty conveyors, dirty, dirty trolleys, uh, notorious for grease and dirt, dirty load bars, all lead to diminished ground. Thus, you get low to no transfer efficiency. So ground, 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 cleanliness, 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 PM, PM, PM in your shop, you have to attention, pay attention to every point of contact for that ground uh, and the health of your electrostatic guns. Yeah, the, the other thing that we probably didn't touch on that's really quick is that when you're doing liquid electrostatics, your paint formulation, to get maximum benefit out of that, you have to have your paint formulated for electrostatics so that it's the right polarity. There are meters for that. We have those. So does your paint supplier. You can test your paint, make sure that you're in the right polarity so that you get maximum transfer of the voltage onto the particles as they come through the atomized particles and then they're attracted to that ground. Correct. Well, Eddie, thank you very much. Uh, what I want to invite you to do is visit Air Power on the internet at airpower-usa.com or call us at our 800 number, 800-334-1001 or visit us on social media. Social media, we love it. We're getting more active on it. We want to do LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Come and contact us. Look for these videos there. The, the best thing that I can say other than that is call us. We'll come out. We'll help you diagnose what's going on, give you tips, give you pointers, make you more efficient, and that you can put more money back in your pocket. That's what we're here for. We're a good partner for you. We're going to make sure that you get maximum benefit That's out right. of the equipment. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Air Power Live. We'll see you again soon. See you next time.